I want to thank all the volunteers that have worked to put this convention on, to work in the track track events out there. I got a couple of sessions out in the, on the track, so I get a little fun out of this myself. And, and it's just rewarding to see all the people that are there working all day so that all the rest of us here can go out and have a good time on the track. And uh, it's good to see everybody. I hope to see you again next year. Um, I'm glad to hear the new plans for the club, the new people are going to be involved. It just uh, looks like we're going forward and, and it's going to have a great time again forever. So I hope that's the case. Thank you all. Chuck, how far away do you live from here? Two hours. That's why he likes the convention. Be in there. <laughs> Lou Spencer is here too. I could give a uh, biography of Lou Spencer that would probably take us until uh, past midnight because he's done so much. Uh, before he started working for uh, Shelby American, he was uh, a dealer of sports cars in Southern California before the Cobra, when a sports car was either English, Italian, or German. There was no real American sports car. Everybody said the Corvette, but it was really, that was in a different league. And Lou was racing Morgans, and he really, really became known as Mr. Morgan. And uh, he was consistently the fastest driver in a Morgan. And when they started building Cobras, a lot of people that were driving sports cars gravitated towards Cobras because they were new, and they were fast, and they were exciting. Um, and he started driving Cobras, and he got a job working for Shelby and became the competition director. And then from there, he moved on to be the, the uh, in charge of the Trans Am team, the competition director for that, in 67 and 68 and 69. And then when Shelby shut down in 1970, uh, I believe he went to work for Holman and Moody, um, and they had a subsidiary in Los Angeles. And then Carol Shelby hired him again as an administrative assistant uh, for, throughout the, the late 70s and into the uh, early 90s. So he's, he's had a, a long and varied experience. Um, and he uh, is one of the, the nicest guys you'll ever meet. And I'll say a little bit more about that in my comments later. But uh, Lou, would you like to come up and quickly recap your, uh, your glory days? guys would kill for the things I got to do. <laughs> Anybody? Uh, the very first time I met Carol Shelby, uh, I had been driving an AC Bristol and working for the guy that was distributing them. And Shelby called up and said, could you figure out what a rolling AC chassis would cost less engine and gearbox? Well, it's easy. Everybody knows what an AC Bristol engine and gearbox costs. So I met him at the Grand Prix up on Melrose Boulevard uh, in Los Angeles and uh, chatted with him, gave him the figure. He told me what he wanted to do. And I kind of smiled. We left. He walked down the street and I shook my head and I said, he'll never do it. Can't be done. And obviously it, it did happen. <laughs> Um, next time I contacted, he contacted me, uh, he said, I've got the first Cobra here, it's out at Riverside, would you like to come out and take a spin? Would I? <laughs> uh, went out and uh, the car was pretty awful. The, uh, every time you go through a corner, you watch the oil pressure gauge drop. And he said, watch out going up through the S's or you'll blow up the engine. Uh, I started enjoying myself, and you start going faster, and the next thing I know, he's out there saying, you know, slow it down. Um, next comment, next contact I had with him, they called and said, would you like to drive a Cobra at Sebring? Well, if you're a racer and somebody offers you a car, you, you'll, you'd kill for the opportunity. And yes, I would. And that was 60, 63. Uh, that was the year we had oil pump, oil pickup problems. 
and uh, I really was very fortunate. I was also careful with the car, and it was the only Cobra that, that lasted and finished the 12 hours. I raced 63, 64, 65 at Sebring. Um, I ran, I don't know what year it was, uh, Elkhart Lake in the 500 in a, in a Cobra. And uh, if you know Morgans, you know that they occasionally lose front wheels and the knockoff comes and you, it goes by you. And as it goes by, there's a very, very distinctive sound. It's <laughs> and you, you know you're going to lose a wheel. So Bob Johnson was starting the car. He pulled in. I said, how is the car? He said, perfect. And I took off. And on the first lap, it was a vibration. And I thought, Bob, what did you do to this car that I'm going to get blamed for? And finished one lap going into the first turn, got set up to make the right. If you know Elkhart, you make the turn, you go down the hill and you make a hard uh, 90 degree right. And as I went in, I <laughs> And I said, Sucker, you're going to lose a wheel. I said, you'll know in just a minute. I straightened it out as it came through the corner. Wheel came right out from under the fender, bouncing down, went right on top of a VW. And I won't use the words here, they're ladies present, that I used at that time. But I told the car that it was going to go back to the pits no matter what. And I got a death grip on the wheel, planted my foot, and I'll tell you the car will go just as fast in a straight line or a left-hand turn without a left front wheel. <laughs> it's a little bit different when you make a right-hand turn. <laughs> Went back into the pits. The crew was working on another car, so I had, had no assistance. I jumped out, grabbed the quick lift that we used to use, started to pull on it. I couldn't pull it. You won't believe this. Carol Shelby walked over, got a hold of it with me, and we got it up. And I'm not being nasty when I say it, but it's just, it's typical. It's the only time in my life I ever saw Carol Shelby work. <laughs> <laughs> somebody got me a hammer, somebody got me a wheel, uh, somebody got me a knockoff, put it back on, went back out with the car. Where we finished, I don't have any idea. That didn't make any difference. Um, Shelby called one day and asked, if uh, I'd like to get involved in a, a dealership with them. And uh, we did, and there was Shelby, myself, Al Dowd, another employee, uh, Tom Reese, and Peyton Kramer. And we opened High Performance Motors. And we thought this was going to be the greatest thing in the world. And we found the location, got it ready, and we were going to sell Cobras and GT350s. But Mr. Ford had a different idea. He said, there's a Ford dealer up the street. Only four dealers can sell GT350s. You are not one, and you will not be one. So that uh, had to be switched. At, at that stage, um, I went to work at the factory and then started off as competition sales. And you can imagine how much fun that was over really over the years, uh, I had the opportunity to sell all of the race cobras that came back, including the Daytona Coupes, where we beg people to give us four or five thousand dollars for the car. And really nobody wanted them. It was just pitiful. If, if we had known what was going to happen then, obviously we would have kept some of the cars. Um, we didn't know that. Nobody could have guessed. We said there's nothing worth as little money as a clapped out race car where there's no place to run it. And uh, you know the results that came from that. Um, I got to do a year, do that for a while. Um, I did PR for a little bit. Um, Got started with a customer assistance program. Uh, customer assistance uh, ended up somewhere or other getting involved in, in the Trans Am. And then Chuck Campbell and I got to do the Trans Am program. Um, 
trying to think what happened after that. I'm old enough now that I don't remember a lot of things. Um, just, just some of the bad ones. But we got to, got to run that. Uh, and I guess that was about the time everything started closing down, moving away, because racing had stopped. I did go with Holman and Moody. Uh, they were putting together a performance program, a performance parts program. And then all of a sudden Ford got out of racing, just like you heard earlier, and that was shut down. Uh, then after a while with that, I got uh, back with Shelby again. So I just went around the mill many times there. Uh, I've had all kinds of fun, met all kinds of people. Uh, couldn't ask for anything better than, than what we went through. It was exciting, I'm glad I did it. Uh, I've also uh, have been excited that over the years, at least some of them, a few years got left out, but I got to come to the, the SAC conventions, and I've always enjoyed it. Uh, you people are fun to be around. Uh, I thank Ken, I thank Rick, and that nice lady that was sitting there and left just a little bit ago, Colleen, I just, I just thank everybody for everything that they've done and the way they built this into something pretty fantastic. Uh, I won't bore you with hours and hours of it. There are so many funny things that happen. You could write a book about it. But I tried that. I did one chapter and it came back from Rick and there were more red lines and red marks <laughs> on it than, than there were letters. I decided, I guess I'm not really a writer. So I, I didn't do that. Uh, thanks for letting me be with you today. It's a great weekend. You've done a fabulous job. And there's just nothing else to say, but thanks to you all. And, and uh, I look forward to uh, the way it's going to expand, the changes that are being made, Marissa. And uh, we'll see you again in future years. Because I've, I've heard other people refer to it before when they say Ford got out of racing. And it, it's something that I don't think has been widely reported. Um, there's, I wrote about it in the new registry in a couple of different places, but you have to look to find it. And Ford started with a program they called uh, Total Performance in 1963. And their goal that they outlined was that they wanted to win uh, Indianapolis 500, they wanted to win a NASCAR championship, they wanted to win a drag race championship, and they wanted to win the sports car endurance championship. Uh, all four things at the same time. And they started this program believing that if they got into racing at that level and they covered the, the, the market, um, they would increase their market share. And at that point, I believe they were selling, uh, their market penetration was about 26% of all cars sold in this country were sold by Ford. And they started this total performance program. We all know how it ended up. They did win Indianapolis. They did win a NASCAR championship. They won a lot of drag racing championships. And they won Le Mans. They won Sebring. They won Daytona. They did everything they wanted to do. And in January of 1970, somebody brought Henry Ford II, who was the president of Ford, he brought him a report, and the report said that after this total performance uh, program that lasted seven years, the market penetration for Ford was still 26%. That they had spent all this money, and did all this work, and they, they really hadn't increased their sales. Nobody could explain it, and all Henry Ford said is, we're out of racing. And when the president of a company that has his name on the building says something like that, the employees take it seriously. And from the people I've talked to, they said that when he said that in the morning, by the next morning, <coughs> there was no visible signs that Ford had ever been in racing. In every office, they took down pictures of drag racing cars and Cobras and Indianapolis cars and everything, and they replaced them with product line pictures of station wagons and Falcons and stuff like that. And that's how Ford got out of racing. <coughs> That's one of, the, one of the facts that, uh, that you're able to, to, uh, to find out when you start digging. Uh, and the way it works is you start looking for information. It comes hard at first. 
you find small nuggets here and there, and you discover that some people you thought knew a lot really didn't know that much. They just thought they did. And as a result, everybody else thought they did too. If you keep digging and asking questions, collecting information, and in short, if you're serious about the subject, you start accumulating this knowledge. And at some point, you reach the tipping point. Instead of searching for new information, new information starts coming to you. And the more you see, the more you learn, the more you learn, the more you know. It doesn't happen overnight, and it doesn't happen all at once, but if you keep it, you keep at it, eventually you gain a perspective that few other people have, and then the question is, what do you do with it? Being involved with a club like SAC provides a simple answer to that question. You share it with other members. The best way to do that is to put everything into a book. Everything is a subjective term, Everything I know now is a lot more than everything I knew in 1982 when I put together the first Shelby World Registry. I don't want it to sound like I did it all by myself because the individual registrars are the ones who actually did all the groundwork. They're the ones who collect the information from a wide variety of sources. Owners provide them with details about their cars. They contact former owners and club members who have seen the cars and they, people report what they've seen, and the registrars browse through everything, books, magazines, videos, and now, of course, the internet, looking for details on the cars that they pay particular attention to. They gather all this information up, sort through it, discard what doesn't agree, and then they know, with what they know not to be correct, and as a result, they've got a body of information that I get my hands on every 10 years to form it into a registry. The registrars and I function as historians, not reporters. Um, not many people realize this. A reporter will go and find out something that happened today and try to write about it. The historian will wait two, three, four, five years and then write about it. And what you find is that the longer you wait, the clearer the picture becomes. And if you don't have to get stuff out immediately, then you're in good shape. You know, you're not going to work for a company like Auto Week and put something out on a weekly basis. You work for a car and driver, you put something out on a monthly basis, or you work for the Shelby American and you put it out on an annual basis and in the registries every 10 years. And they all have their place. Today's Cobra race cars, the one that you see restored to perfection and sitting in a car show or a museum <coughs> or on a vintage race grid, are not accurate representations of the cars when they were originally raced back in the, the 1960s. They had some rough edges, they actually had quite a few rough edges. And there wasn't time to smooth them over or buff them out because there was always the next race weekend. When Cobras were raced, even when they were new, they were not the sparkling jewels in a velvet lined box that you see today. The magnesium wheels were rarely polished, dents got pounded out, and paint was spotted in with rattle cans. You'd never imagine somebody doing that to these cars today. This was the context in which they were raced in the 1960s. The cars you see today here or at vintage races may be the same cars that created the Cobra's history, but today they exist in a totally different context. And the context is important. The Cobra just didn't pop up at a racetrack and begin racing. It was a result of an evolution over a period of years of what came before it, and it helps tell the story about the context that it, it is in now. Uh, for example, if you walk through the paddock here at the convention, you'll see enclosed trailers in every direction. Back in the early and mid-1960s, there was no such thing as an enclosed trailer. In 1965, I went to Bridgehampton to watch the USRRC race, the United States Road Racing Champion, which later became the Can-Am. Uh, I remember reading in Sports Car Graphic, Road and Track, Car and Driver, about Jim Hall's chaparrales. And I couldn't wait to see him. And when Jim Hall and Hap Sharp rolled into the track, they were driving two white Chevy pickups that towed two white chaparral 2Cs on open single axle trailers, and nobody lifted an eyebrow because that's how everybody else came to the races. In 1966, I met a guy who was racing a Cobra. Now, I had an uncle who was a real mechanical whiz. There wasn't anything he couldn't fix. 
he was the, the car guy in the family. He called me up one night and he said, he's got somebody, he said, I have somebody at my house I'd like you to meet. Why don't you hop in your car and take a ride over here? And I was about, uh, I think I was 17 at the time, going on 18. And this guy's name was Mel Wenzel. And he was in his early 20s and he had a Cobra race car. My uncle was helping him rebuild the rear end, put new bearings in. They didn't have a, uh, uh, they didn't have a bearing press. And so what they did, was they put the rear end into the oven at about 500 degrees for an hour, and they put the bearings in the freezer and froze them. Because you know that the heat, heat expands and cold contracts. And then they were able to pound the bearings <coughs> into, into, the, into place in the carrier. Right, I thought this was pretty fascinating. This guy had a cobra, and I'm reading all the stuff in the magazines about cobras. This wasn't exactly what I had in mind. But it turned out that he was a draftsman at the time making about 125 bucks a week. He lived at home. He drove a 60 Cor Corvair every day. He didn't even have a tow car for his trailer, but he had this Cobra and he wanted to go racing. Uh, I do remember that my aunt was less than thrilled about the odor of gear lube in her oven for a couple of weeks. <laughs> but Mel was going to Bridgehampton the following week and I was astounded to hear that he didn't have anybody to go with him. He had to load the car himself, load all the tools himself, and he invited me to go along with him. Uh, pinch me, I must be dreaming. And that's how a 17-year-old kid became the crew chief on a Cobra race team. And there was nobody else on the team except the driver, so I guess that made me the chief. I never knew the car's serial number until 10 years later when we started researching the car's history. Um, up until that time, if you called Shelby American and you wanted parts for a Cobra, they asked you if it was worm and sector or rack and pinion steering. And that's the only distinction between the cars. The serial number had absolutely no other importance. As it turned out, the car was CX2127. CSX 2127 was an X factory team car and it had been raced for a few months until it was replaced with the next factory team car. And then Hal Keck bought it. And Hal raced it for a year and then sold it to another racer named Mike Goth in 1965. He raced it, he raced it for a year and then Mel bought it from him. So it was raced its entire life. We towed it to the open to the track on an open trailer. It was pulled by Mel's father's new Pontiac Tempest. And this was the context Cobras were raced in in the mid-60s. Uh, the entry fee for a typical SCCA national race was $25. Tech was on Saturday, practice was on Saturday, qualifying was on Saturday. There was a warm-up on Sunday and then the race. And they had a, a, a little uh, program at most of the tracks that if you made the grid for the race on Sunday, they gave you your entry fee back. And it doesn't sound like much today, but $25 made a lot of difference, especially when we were racing on a shoestring. And, and when I say shoestring, it's hard to believe. Um, they used to give away race gas at the track. They, they'd get a, I don't know, 20,000 gallon tanker and they'd pull it up into the paddock area and everybody got all the gas they wanted. And before the, the race was over, before we went out on the race on Sunday, we'd take two five-gallon jerry cans and fill them up with race gas. And then when the race was over, we'd bring the Cobra over and fill that up. It had a 42-gallon tank, and we'd back it on the trailer, and we'd use that gas to get home. And, uh, the tank in the Tempest ran dry. We just siphoned it out and, and from the race car directly into the, into the street <coughs> car, into the tow car. Um, they would give away spark plugs. And all you had to do was put their decal on the side of your car. And I can remember driving the Cobra over to the, the spark plug guy and getting a box of champion spark plugs, putting the champion spark plug on the right side of the car, driving it around the, the corner in the paddock to the NGK salesman, getting a box of NGKs and putting their decal on the left side. We did the same thing with oil. We got cases of Valvoline and cases of Oilsome. And we figured that, that nobody's going to take two pictures of the same car and you're not going to see you know, each side together. So we, it looked like there, we had separate sponsors. No, there was a time when we went to Watkins Glen and, and we were so tight with money that uh, we stopped in this restaurant and Mel went in first, sat down at the counter, and ordered a full meal. I came in about five minutes later and sat next to him and ordered a Coke. 
He was finished with his meal. He took the check from my coat, went up, paid it at the counter, and left. Then I called the waitress over, and I said, there's been a mistake here. I said, this guy grabbed my check. I didn't have all this food. I, all I had was a coat. And so she said a few words under her breath, and, and I paid for the coke. And we went about a mile down the road, stopped at another restaurant, and I went in first. <laughs> we ended up getting enough points to go out to the Riverside runoffs in 1966. Actually, we finished fifth in the division. And the two cars that finished, the car that finished second and third, were both involved in accidents at the end of the season. And so they asked, they invited uh, Mel to bring his car because they wanted to fill the field. So that's how the first time I got out to California was on Thanksgiving weekend of 1966. And Mel wanted a, he talked to Lou Spencer because Lou was the competition director and he got Lou to promise him the use of a GT350 for the weekend. And he told him, you know, we're, we're on a shoestring, we don't have a lot of money, and we really need that car when we get out there. And Lou said, that's fine, you know, we'll be happy to help you out. He had been sending race assistance checks for the, the whole year. We'd, we'd get a second place or a first place. I think it was $150 for a first and $75 for a second, which again, sounds like not much money today, but it really was. And it, it, it kept us going to the track. And so we got out there at Riverside and we went over, took a cab from the hotel over to Shelby American and met Lou. He, I'm sure he doesn't remember me at all. I'd be, you know, really surprised if he did. But he was gracious enough to show us around the factory, show us the assembly lines, the race shop. And then Mel put the squeeze on him and said, you know, do you have a GT350? And he was, Lou was a little sheepish about it. He said, well, he said, all the VIPs from Ford came out for the races and they took all the public relations cars. And Mel said, but I, I, I really had my heart set on a GT350 and he was, you know, had his hat in his hand and he was cringing and finally Lou felt sorry for him and he says, well, we'll go over and get you a GT350 Hertz car from the LA airport. It turned out Mel wasn't 25 and you had to be 25 to rent a car and so, I don't know, somehow Lou put some pressure on somebody at Hertz and he, he signed for the car and we got the car. Well, the reason that we needed the car was we needed a tow vehicle. <laughs> Mel had a friend who lived in California and his father lived back in New York where he lived. And he, he paid his father gas in order for him to tow the car, the Cobra, out there. So we wrapped up the Cobra and all the spares and tools and spare tires. And, and this guy came and he had, I think he had a big Oldsmobile wagon took the car and drove it to California in return for getting uh, uh, his gas bills paid. We got out to California, the car is sitting in a race shop, and we show up with a, with a GT350H, and Mel in, had enough foresight to, to stop at Sears on the way to the airport, and he bought a trailer hitch for, this, for a Mustang. And when we got there, he started prepping the Cobra, I put the trailer hitch on this Hertz car, and while I had it up on the lift, uh, I made a plug for the transmission and took the, the uh, speedometer cable out. So for the week that we had the car, when we turned it in, we only had 73 miles on it. Uh, I remember meeting the guy at the last convention we had in Michigan, and he was able to determine that he had that Hertz car. It was a guy from Canada because it had the, still had the holes in the rear floor pan where we bolted the, the, the uh, trailer hitch, and it still had the uh, wire taped up where we, we ran the wire, and, you know, to get the trailer uh, taillights. And so he solved the mystery of what happened to that Hertz car, although I told him it's probably got a few more miles on it than it's beyond it. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, that was uh, the real deal. And, and, you know, you think about all these race teams today, and they have all of their... Uh, uh, all, all of their technology, and they, they've got a whole truck that's got nothing but